On July 3, 1938, a locomotive did something that should have been impossible. It wasn't the biggest engine ever built. It wasn't the most powerful. And it certainly wasn't designed to break records. But on that summer day, on a stretch of track in eastern England, the Eleanor A4 Mallard reached 126 miles per hour. And that record? It still stands. 86 years later, no steam locomotive has ever gone faster. This is the story of the Mallard and the engineers who proved that elegance could beat brute force. Along the way, we'll encounter wind tunnels, racing rivalries, a designer who understood birds better than most ornithologists, and a philosophy of engineering that we seem to have forgotten entirely. So let's begin. But first, what exactly was happening in the 1930s that made everyone so obsessed with speed? Now, to understand why the Mallard matters, you need to understand the world it was born into. By the mid-1930s, Europe was in the grip of what historians sometimes call the speed craze. Germany had the Autobahn. Italy had Mussolini's trains running on time, or so the propaganda claimed. And Britain. Britain had a problem. See, the British railway system was, by that point, already ancient by industrial standards. The first public railway, the Stockton and Darlington, had opened in 1825. By the 1930s, the infrastructure was over a century old. The companies were competing fiercely, and everyone was looking for an edge. Speed became that edge. Not just because it was practical, though faster journeys certainly helped, but because speed meant prestige. Speed meant national pride. And in the 1930s, with fascism rising across Europe, national pride mattered. The London and Northeastern Railway, the Ulner, was one of the big four railway companies that dominated British rail after the 1923 grouping, and they had a chief mechanical engineer named Nigel Gresley. I mention this because without Gresley, there is no Mallard. Without Gresley, this story doesn't exist. Gresley was, by all accounts, a quiet man, reserved, not the type to seek publicity, but he had an obsession that would define his career, streamlining. The thing is, Gresley understood something that many of his contemporaries didn't. He understood that at high speeds, air resistance becomes the dominant force working against a locomotive. Double your speed and you quadruple the drag, triple your speed and you're fighting nine times the resistance. This isn't complicated physics, it's basic aerodynamics. But in the 1930s, most locomotive designers were still thinking in terms of raw power, bigger boilers, more cylinders, heavier machines. Gressley thought differently. He had visited Germany in 1933 and seen the diesel-electric Flying Hamburger, a streamlined rail car that could hit 100 miles per hour. The Germans were achieving this not through brute force, but through careful attention to airflow. Gresley came back to England with an idea. What if you could apply those same principles to a steam locomotive? Now here's where it gets interesting. Gresley didn't just slap a fancy casing on an existing design and call it streamlined. He actually tested shapes. He worked with the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington, and they put models in a wind tunnel. They tested different nose shapes, different cab profiles, different ways of smoothing the transition between the boiler and the tender. This was serious aerodynamic research, the kind of work you'd expect from an aircraft manufacturer, not a railway company. The result was the A4 class, and the shape they arrived at was, honestly, beautiful. The nose came to a gentle point, sweeping back in a curve that looks almost organic. The sides were smooth, with the mechanical components hidden behind valences. Even the whistle was recessed to reduce drag. Gressley's team calculated that the streamlining reduced air resistance by about one-third at high speed. That's not a minor improvement. That's the difference between breaking a record and being an also-ran. But the A4 wasn't just about aerodynamics. The engine itself was a masterpiece of efficient design. 
It used a three-cylinder layout with Gresley's own conjugated valve gear, a clever mechanism that drove the inside cylinder from the motion of the two outside cylinders, eliminating the need for additional moving parts inside the frames where they'd be difficult to maintain. The boiler pressure was 250 pounds per square inch, which was high for the era but not unprecedented. The driving wheels were 6 feet 8 inches in diameter, big wheels for high speed, because a larger diameter means fewer revolutions per mile, which means less wear and lower mechanical stress. I want you to think about that for a moment. Every single component of this locomotive was designed with efficiency in mind, not maximum power, not the biggest numbers on a specification sheet. Efficiency, elegance, doing more with less. The first A4, number 2509 Silver Link, entered service in September 1935. On its press run, it hit 112 miles per hour, twice. The journalists on board were reportedly terrified and exhilarated in equal measure. The owner had their publicity coup, and Gresley had proven his concept. But Gresley wasn't satisfied, and neither were the Germans. See, the rivalry between Britain and Germany in the 1930s extended to railways. In 1936, the German DRG Class 5 locomotive reached 124.5 miles per hour. It was a streamlined steam locomotive, and it now held the world speed record. The British, and Gresley specifically, took this personally. The Elner began planning a record attempt. They selected locomotive number 4468, which had been built in March 1938 at Doncaster Works. It was named Mallard after the duck. Now, I should mention the A4s were all named after birds. Silver Link, Kingfisher, Bittern, Golden Eagle. Gresley had a thing for birds. And the Mallard, specifically, is a bird known for its speed in flight and its streamlined body when swimming. The name was not an accident. On July 3, 1938, everything came together. The plan was to conduct a brake test on the main line between Grantham and Peterborough. At least, that was the official justification. In reality, everyone involved knew what this was really about. Driver Joseph Duddington was at the controls. Fireman Thomas Bray was managing the fire, and the locomotive was mallard. The stretch of track they chose included Stoke Bank, a long downhill gradient that would allow the locomotive to build speed while the steam pressure did its work. The gradient was about 1 in 200, which doesn't sound like much, but over several miles it adds up. Gravity was going to help. If you've made it this far, you're probably into this kind of story. Quick question. Where are you watching from right now? Drop it in the comments. And if you're enjoying this, hit subscribe. We do this every week. All right, back to Stoke Bank. Because what happened next is the stuff of engineering legend. Duddington opened up the regulator. The exhaust beat quickened. The speedometer needle climbed 100 miles per hour. 110, 115, the locomotive was screaming down that gradient, and everyone on board knew they were in uncharted territory. At 12.15 p.m., the dynamometer car recorded a speed of 126 miles per hour. Some accounts say the needle briefly touched 128, but the official record is 126. It didn't matter. They had beaten the German record. They had set a mark that no steam locomotive would ever surpass. But here's the thing about pushing machines to their absolute limits. There's usually a cost. And there was. The middle big end bearing overheated during the run. The white metal was damaged, and Mallard limped into Peterborough for repairs. She had given everything she had to break that record. The fact that she still made it under her own steam says something about the quality of her construction. Now... I could spend a long time talking about the technical details of what happened during those few minutes on Stoke Bank. The exhaust temperature, the boiler pressure, the precise steam flow rates. But honestly, the numbers aren't really the point. The point is what those numbers represent. Think about what Gresley and his team accomplished. They took a technology, steam propulsion, that was already mature. 
The basic principles hadn't changed much since the early 1800s. Water goes in, fire heats it, steam comes out, steam pushes pistons, pistons turn wheels. That's it. That's the whole thing. And yet, through careful, thoughtful, elegant engineering, they extracted performance that seemed impossible. They didn't do it by making the boiler bigger. They didn't do it by adding more cylinders or increasing the pressure beyond what the materials could handle. They did it by reducing waste. By understanding airflow, by designing every component to work in harmony with every other component, they did it through efficiency. And here's where I want to make a broader point. Because I think the mallard represents something that we've lost in modern engineering. Look at how we approach speed today. When we want a faster car, we add more horsepower. When we want a faster plane, we burn more fuel. When we want a faster train, we pump more electricity into the motors. It's brute force. It's throwing resources at a problem rather than thinking our way through it. The Shinkansen, the TGV, the various high-speed rail networks around the world, they're engineering marvels in their own right. I'm not dismissing them but they achieved their speed through raw power consumption in a way that would have been unthinkable to engineers like Gressley. A modern high-speed train draws megawatts of electricity from the grid. The Mallard generated all its power from a firebox burning coal. There's a philosophy embedded in the A4's design. It says, understand your constraints, work within them, find the inefficiencies, and eliminate them one by one. Don't brute force your way to a solution when an elegant one exists. The streamlined casing of the Mallard wasn't just beautiful, though it was. It was functional. Every curve served a purpose. The shape wasn't decoration, it was engineering. And that integration of form and function is something that the best designers in any field understand intuitively. I mention this because I think we've become lazy. We've become accustomed to having so much power available, electrical power, computational power, mechanical power, that we've stopped asking whether we really need all of it. We've stopped asking whether there's a smarter way. The engineers who designed the Mallard didn't have that luxury. Coal had to be shoveled by hand. Every pound of steam had to be generated through physical labor. Waste wasn't just inefficient. It was exhausting. That constraint forced them to think harder and thinking harder, produced better solutions. Now, I don't want to romanticize the past too much. Steam locomotives were dirty, labor-intensive, and ultimately obsolete. There's a reason we don't use them anymore for regular service. The shift to diesel and electric traction was inevitable, and on balance, a good thing. But something was lost in that transition, a certain craftsmanship, a certain understanding that the goal isn't just to achieve a result, but to achieve it well. The Mallard sits today in the National Railway Museum in York. If you ever get the chance to see her in person, I'd recommend it. She's smaller than you might expect. Photographs make her look enormous. But standing next to her, she's surprisingly compact. That's part of her genius. She achieved what she achieved not by being the biggest or the heaviest, but by being the most refined. What happened to the people involved in the story? Nigel Gressley continued as chief mechanical engineer of the Elner until his death in 1941. He didn't live to see the end of steam, which is probably for the best. The post-war years were not kind to his beloved locomotives. Nationalization came in 1948, and the new British Railways standardization program had little room for the elegant individualism of the A4s. Driver Joseph Duddington became something of a celebrity after the record run. He was interviewed, photographed, and celebrated. He retired from the railway in 1944 and died in 1967, never having lost his pride in what he and Mallard had accomplished together. Fireman Thomas Bray, the man who actually had to keep the fire going at those incredible speeds, is often forgotten in the story. But without him shoveling coal at precisely the right rate, maintaining the steam pressure, there would have been no record. He continued working on the railways until retirement. And the Mallard herself? 
She stayed in service until 1963, when steam traction was being phased out across British railways. She was saved from scrapping, one of only six A4s to survive, and became part of the National Collection. In 1988, and on the 50th anniversary of the record, she was steamed again and hauled a special train. Even then, decades past her prime, she moved with a grace that modern observers found remarkable. The record she set has never been seriously challenged. Oh, there have been faster trains, much faster. The French TGV has exceeded 350 miles per hour in testing. The Japanese Maglev has topped 370. But those aren't steam locomotives. Those are entirely different technologies, powered by electricity, running on purpose-built tracks, with none of the constraints that Gresley's team faced. No steam locomotive has ever touched 126 miles per hour since July 3, 1938, and none ever will. The age of steam is over. The Mallard's record is permanent, frozen in time, like a fossil of a lost era. But what that record represents, the triumph of elegant engineering over brute force, the victory of efficiency over excess, the proof that understanding your medium deeply enough can produce results that seem impossible. That's timeless. That's what I think about when I see the Mallard. Not just the speed, but the way the speed was achieved. We live in an age of abundant power. Our cars have hundreds of horsepower. Our phones have more computing power than the Apollo missions. We've become accustomed to solving problems by throwing resources at them, and that works most of the time. But I wonder sometimes if we've forgotten the lessons that engineers like Gresley knew instinctively. Constraints breed creativity. Limitations force innovation. When you can't simply add more power, you have to think more carefully. You have to understand your materials, your physics, your system as a whole. You have to be elegant. The Mallard was elegant. She was beautiful, not because beauty was the goal, but because beauty is what efficiency looks like when it's taken to its logical conclusion. Every line served a purpose. Every curve reduced drag. She was designed by people who understood that the fastest path is rarely the straightest one, that sometimes you have to work with nature rather than against it. And she flew. On that July day in 1938, on that stretch of track in Lincolnshire, she flew. That is the story of the Mallard. Subscribe if you want more, and let me know in the comments, had you heard of this locomotive before today? Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.